I'm Norman Swan. Welcome to Taking Stock, the health hazards of farming in this International Year of the Farmer. Did you know that? I didn't know that. The International Year of the Farmer. Australian farmers and their families face significant health and occupational hazards. They have poorer health outcomes than people in the cities, higher mortality, more chronic disease and morbidity, and over-represented in accidents and injury rates. Tonight, we will be taking stock on these issues. We are coming to you across Australia through the Rural Health Education Foundation Satellite Network. We've got viewers tonight across Australia in places such as Dalby in Queensland, Bahrain, New South Wales, Ballarat in Victoria, Eniaba in Western Australia, and Sharp Bay in WA as well. The programme is also going out live as a television broadcast on NITV, so welcome to our NITV viewers. We're interactive as always and you have the opportunity to comment on issues and put your questions to the panel. So we want your phone calls, emails and faxes whenever you want to ask a question. The phone number is 1800 817 268. The other number there is if you're unfortunate enough to be in the Sydney area. And the fax numbers are 1800 633 410. Or you can email us directly at questions at rhef.com.au. As always, there are a number of useful resources available for you on the Rural Health Education Foundation's website rhef.com.au. Now let me introduce our panel to you. Clinical Associate Professor Susan Brumby is the founder, founding director of the National Centre for Farmer Health. That's a partnership between Western District Health Service and Deakin University in Victoria. Welcome Susan. Good evening Nolan. Susan leads the implementation of five key strategies to improve the health, well-being and safety of farm women and women. She has extensive agricultural experience herself, managing the family property of beef cattle and fine wool for the last 12 years. How's it going? Super, thanks. <laughs> Super, that's right. Super. Tell you. us how it's really going on the farm. <laughs> oh, it's a bit tough on the farm. Is it? Yeah. So the rains haven't helped? Oh, well, uh, after 10 years of drought, um, but A long way to catch up. long way to catch up. Professor Scott Kitchener is a public health physician and general practitioner on the Darling Downs. He's worked in rural Queensland, New South Wales, Western Australia, as well as East Timor and Bougainville. Bougainville. He's now director of the Queensland Medical Rural Medi Sorry, director of Queensland Rural Medical Education. Welcome, Scott. Thanks, Donna. Scott is in rural practice in Clifton and Pittsworth on the Darling Downs. Jody Morton grew up on the family farm in Western Australia. She's married to a farmer and is the remote area nurse in the Eniaba Silver Chain Health Centre. You better tell where people, people where Eniaba is, Jody. Uh, yeah, thanks, Norma. Yeah, it's between Perth and Geraldton. Right. Yeah. And classified as remote? Yes. Sounds it. <laughs> Jody has completed the Sustainable Farm Families Health Professionals course. And last but not least is Associate Professor David Perkins, who's Director of the Centre for Remote Health Research in Broken Hill. Welcome, David. David is a health researcher with a background in health management and rural mental health issues. He's also editor of the 20-year-old, 20 years old this year, the Australian Journal of Rural Health. Congratulations mm -hmm. on that. That's a fantastic uh, okay. achievement, an important journal, and a chief investigator in the Centre for Research Excellence in Rural and Remote Primary Health Care. So welcome to you all. And what we're going to do uh, tonight is actually start with a case study which brings together some of the issues that many of you are well aware of in terms of uh, people who work on the land. John is 34 years old and he's brought into your surgery by his wife in the car. He collapsed on the kitchen floor with severe abdominal pain and is sweating profusely. She tells uh, the receptionist, the practice nurse, that he's had pain for some days and on questioning said he'd commented that his stools were much darker than usual but thought he had just a case of gastro and he hasn't felt like eating for days. So Scott, you get the call into the treatment room. Thanks Norman. Uh, I'm fortunate to work in, uh, in practices where there are uh, small hospitals and we have a practice nurse in, in each of Pittsworth and Clifton. So I'd, I'd normally come in and I'm sure the patient would be on oxygen already. Um, so we would normally check the um, airways, breathing and circulation. But uh, the holding capacity of the rural hospitals that are attached to the practices is such that we would move this on if it was an acute abdomen. Um, certainly I'd be calling the ambulance and cannulating. Uh, one of the benefits of working in rural practice though is that we would have an idea about the, um, the long-term medical history of this patient. So uh, I'd be wondering about whether this fellow uh, has an upper GI bleed, uh, particularly with the history of the, uh, of the dark stools. Uh, and knowing that in the communities that I work in there's been a lot of financial stress and, and farmers are having a hard time 
uh, and it wouldn't be surprising uh, to see... Get a perforated DU or something that's right, like that. Yeah, and I think that's the sort of thing that we would... W normally we would um, send them up the road 50k to Toowoomba Hospital in the ambulance. Jody, he sat in this for a while. He did, which is quite common in the farming, farming community in my experience. They are very time restricted. Um, with the, they like to get jobs done on time. I mean, their whole financial income depends that they get the crop in on time or that they get the cows milked on time, um, whatever farming that they're in. They also, with the economic climate at the moment, a lot of farmers have had to put off workforce. So they therefore don't, can't say to somebody else, can you go and do this job for me? They need to actually go out and do that themselves. And majority of farmers that I'm aware of will actually go and do that job before they look at presenting. I know I certainly, if a farmer comes into my clinic saying these sort of symptoms, you stand up and take it pretty seriously because you know that they're really unwell if they're actually voluntarily coming in. So Susan, how much of this in your view is just being a bloke and a country bloke versus being on the, on the land, being a farmer? Uh, I think there's a couple of issues. One is that we certainly know that the further away from health services that you live, the longer people wait at home, whether it's for chest pain or abdominal pain like this, and that's whether you're a man or a woman. So I think that's important. I think um, in terms of uh, men and women on farms, that certainly uh, the opportunity for men to probably be linked into their health service is a little bit less than perhaps women that may, of course, have had children or been looking after or taken kids to doctors so they're not as linked in as well but I do think the distance effect is actually really profound and needs to be considered. And I think also on that um, when you've got your smaller centres they don't want to be a bother at one o'clock exactly in the morning. Right. They know yeah. that you're there on your own, you're on call 24-7, they don't want to get you out of bed unnecessarily mm. um, so that they don't want to interrupt um, your night's sleep. They put that over precedence of their own health. What do we know, David, from the research in terms of whether there, there is a, you know, the, the, a culture of attitudes towards health which goes over and up, which is overlaid upon the difficulties of working on the farm anyway? We, we know that farmers are used to solving their own problems. We know that they have a culture of um, care for the land, of care mm -hmm. for their family, mm -hmm. of being the one who will stand up and will um, sort things out and that moving into a position where you are dependent, where you've lost control, is problematic. We also know that farmers um, have um, death rates 33% higher than the rest of the population from all causes. And so the evidence says this is a group of people... So at any age? They're at any age, yeah. Mm. This, is a, this is a group of people who are at risk. They're a national health priority, according to the... So you're saying the life expectancy of the farmers a third less than the average Australian? No, I'm saying they have death rates a third higher right. than the um, general population. And that you know, they're, they're a national priority. And that, uh, as Jody says, if a farmer turns up mm -hmm. with a problem like this, you take them seriously because they don't waste your time. But there's also an issue for the wife here, who's brought him in. She's got, a, she's got a dilemma here. She's probably left kids at home yep. with a neighbour and now another 50 kilometres to Toowoomba or wherever. Yes, that's right. And what does she do? Does she go in the ambulance with her husband? Does she go back to the farm? Well, I guess even the instance is that often we find people that have bundled their loved ones, whether it's children uh, or husbands, into cars and travelled at risk. So they're all there. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and so the road trip is as risky as everything else? Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And you, rather than sitting at home and waiting for an ambulance because people are fearful and they want to actually be doing something to help. So, what is, Scott, what are some of the myths that abound around living on the farm? Oh, the myths? Well, uh, I think that it's not a myth that, uh, that farmers don't tend to become the worried well. Uh, but one of the myths that I've found working in rural practice is the, uh, is the concept that, that farmers are well off, uh, where in actual fact, uh, as a socio-economic class, they're, they're rather down the, the scale. Um, financially, they're, they're not uh, flush most of the times, and, and incomes are very sporadic and, and uh, difficult to predict. And so I find that the concept that, that there's a, a landed gentry uh, out there in rural Australia is, is quite a myth. Jodie, what are the myths from your perspective? Um, I'd say probably more that farming is a healthy um, lifestyle, that they are all fit and strong and 
work, do hard, hard work. Well, it's probably their self-image as well, the rugged farmer, isn't it? Yeah, I guess. Um, Whereas they're sitting in the, with, the Yeah, they, the they spend a lot of time now either sitting in the ute, sitting in the tractor, sitting in the truck. A lot of the actual really physical um, farm work that used to be done is, is done differently these days. So they don't have that um, high cardiovascular workout all day like they used to get. And I presume that their food intake reflects their image of themselves rather than, or other people's image yes, of themselves very, rather than... very high the, protein, high, high uh, fat, like, yeah, they not, not the healthiest lifestyle. A lot of it is what they actually produce on the farm themselves as well, so it's not like nice lean meats. It's, um, yeah and far too big a quantity. I thought Australia's beef herd had become much leaner <laughs> over the years, but maybe they don't eat the best cuts. Mm. David? I, I guess to the, the theory that they are young people, they're in their 30s, they're wearing mm. RM Williamson hats and that they're young and active, where in the average age of farmers is somewhere in their 50s, and many of them are working through until their 70s. And so we're dealing with a group of people who are older, who have the problems of ageing, whether it's memory, whether it's hearing, whether it's I problems thought, of previous yeah, injuries. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Susan? Um, I would agree with, uh, with everybody uh, what they've said. Certainly our experience is uh, very much about having a ready source of protein and, and large amounts of, of red meat in their freezers, which of course when you tell people to eat a small amount, 120 grams, you know, that's breakfast. Yeah, um, it's not even breakfast, it doesn't even <laughs> touch the sides going down. Um, but certainly when we work with farmers, that surprise that, that Rural people have a shorter life expectancy than metropolitan people always comes as a shock because they will always tell you that they believe they have the longer life expectancy, that they are much healthier than their city slickers with pollution and things. Living in the Garden of Eden. Mm -hmm. So tell us about the Sustainable Farm Families Program. <coughs> uh, sure. The Sustainable Farm Families Program uh, started actually in 2002 with a fund from RUDIC, Rural Industries Research Development um, Corporation, and it was designed to basically address health well-being and safety of farm men and women and it was initiated because uh, we come from Hamilton, an agricultural hub and we were seeing... Um, Hamilton and Victoria. Yes, uh, yeah, uh, seeing uh, you know early cases of people dying from uh, injury, uh, suicide and preventable cardiovascular diseases. So the program was developed, uh, farmers come in over three years, it's very much designed to be farm men and women uh, and they get weighed and measured. So and you assessed. focus them on when they're gathering anyway at fairs and so on? No, 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 it's a, a specific a standalone program that runs through a, an industry group such as you know Top Crop or Best But Milk. you go where they go? Yes, we go into their own rural community. Yep. And they go through the program and they learn about cardiovascular disease, heart, uh, diabetes, cancer, men's health, women's health, um, farm health and safety certainly included, and uh, gender topics as well as physical activity. And it's, so we have longitudinal data as well as behaviour as well over time and knowledge. And do you get behaviour change? We absolutely get behaviour change and it's, it's been evaluated by uh, external people. The key thing I, I think is if people come to the program with three or more risk factors, they are the people that get the best benefit from the program. And you even teach farmers to read labels in the supermarket? We certainly do. We uh, certainly do. We take them to the supermarket and show them what they're putting on the plate at home. Uh, and uh, we've got a picture here of farmers. What are these farmers doing in this next uh, shot here? Well, they're very disappointed when they realise that there's actually 40 serves of ice cream in there and they realise yes. they think there's only 10. So they go through workshops? They do and they enjoy that. They like learning about their health, well-being and safety. That's, that's good. And what about uptake of exercise? Uh, we talked to them about exactly what Jody was talking about, about realising that there's all sorts of different exercise and it's important to be active. And uh, we've got them here, is this, um, is this a casualty uh, exercise or what? <laughs> no, this is actually farmers learning how to do a meditation. Uh, this is the stress session. And I would like to say about perceptions is people didn't think that farmers would be interested in stress, but they certainly are and in learning skills to um, overcome that. And here we're actually fitting a face mask, which is uh, very much no point in wearing a mask if it doesn't fit you properly. And we also have um, a photograph of one of the deadliest machines on the farm these days, That's exactly the quad right. bike. Mm. 
What, David, what are the statistics for injuries on farms these days? And this is, this is, this is really taken over from the tractor as a major killer. This is taken over from the tractor and the statistics are that the tractor deaths are coming down very significantly and that they're usually actually the tractor running over somebody rather than the tractor rolling over and there being a, a death that way, that the quad bike deaths are... And you don't have open cab, uh, cabins anymore, they've got a cage cabins. around the driver. Yeah, the, the rollover systems. Um, that the quad bikes were really designed for something else. They're great for getting around the farm, people love them but they are given tasks which they're not designed for and the question arises as to whether there can be some mechanism of ensuring that they don't fall on top of you. And um, the... So here's one after an accident. Here's, here's one out of an accident. Tell from us the, the story behind this. The story here was that the Tokal College decided that they wanted to put that rollover bar or that compression, that a safety bar on the back so they did that and um, a student was out trying to um, round up some horses and the student went over an uneven piece of ground, um, the quad bike tipped over and the student um, got a, a broken collarbone um, but the, the college policy was helmets for staff and um, rollover bars as it were for all staff and all students and all quad bikes and the evidence and the suggestion of the head was that um, the student would have been <coughs> killed otherwise. And there's a, if you go to YouTube and if you look up Toko College Quad Bike, you'll see a nice two minute um, video which tells you about, tells you about the story. But there's an issue here that we don't really know what works, we know with tractors, but we, Trip Scott, but we don't yeah. know with quad bikes. I, I think this is, it's a good idea, uh, but the risk is that there's no evidence that this is actually protective yet. Uh, there's, a, there's a manufacturer uh, in Toowoomba as well and, and he produces a very similar product to that uh, which is terrific but I, I think all we can really say is that it's going to change the role of the dynamics of the, of the vehicle. It isn't necessarily going to work in terms of protecting you in a rollover. Uh, in, in, in the rollover protection systems in a tractor that, that uh, David mentioned there's a, um, uh, you know, there's a requirement for a seat belt so that you don't actually fall out and get hit by the rollover protection system and that obviously isn't the case in uh, in quad bikes. So I, I think the jury's still out. We, d we urgently and desperately need evidence around this uh, and then a standardisation needs to be put in place. And they may need a cage as well. What are the other statistics? We've alluded to them <coughs> just in the country, but I mean, just, uh, you okay. talked about the 33% yep. age-adjusted death the, risk. The, one of the key uh, statistics is that <coughs> road deaths, tr um, farmers travel a lot of miles on poor roads in fast cars and um, the road deaths are twice as high as for the Australian population. So just on ordinary roads, um, deaths on the farm are high um, through um, farm injuries, through transport of various sorts. Um, the evidence on obesity, I think, is a bit mixed. Some are saying farmers are overweight. Others are saying that um, it depends on what industry you're in, what sort of farm work you're doing. Um, suicide is high, and for farmers aged over 65, the suicide rate is twice the adult male population of a comparable age. Um, cardiovascular disease is at 40% above the male population of a similar age. Prostate cancer is twice as high. There's that's deaths from prostate cancer. Deaths from prostate, prostate and cancer. And that's probably with other cancers, late diagnosis. Yeah, sure. Um, lymphatic cancers are almost twice as high. Mm. And cancers of the colon and that might be occupational exposure. Yeah. yeah. So the, the evidence is that there are a series of cancers and other conditions where deaths are particularly high. There, are, there may be some cancers where um, farming is protective. And interestingly, we know from evidence in America and Canada that actually farming is protective and you do better than the comparable population. It appears in Australia the it's cancer actually registries in Australia risk. don't bear that out. But, and of course, these are, these are deaths. Um, so yeah. one of the problems is that... Uh, that the impact upon death is also takes into account the effect of access to health care and, and therapeutic it? options mm. and we, we certainly know that there's good evidence that the further away from a metropolitan centre you are, the more chance you have of, of dying from a cancer. Later uh, stage of diagnosis. Mm. And also access to, to adequate therapy. therapy. And, the, and the other aspect of deaths is that it, we don't even count the most common cancer in, in and particularly it's a, a problem for farmers and that's non-melanoma to skin cancer. Uh, it's so common we don't count it. Uh, it it only probably causes 400 deaths a year, so looking at statistics around mortality uh, doesn't really give the gravity um, of, uh, of importance of, of this cancer. And child deaths are high. 
Sadly, child deaths are very high in, uh, in agricultural populations uh, and uh, they, they devastate um, community, agricultural communities when they occur. And mostly from injury. And they're vehicle related, they're dams related, yeah, drowning. Um, drowning. they're related to horses and animals and actually getting animals yeah. that are not appropriate for them at their age or at their skill set. Yeah. And there's quite a percentage too of those children that aren't actually the farm children. Mm. The, the farm children are often educated um, by the parents, but the parents don't impart that information onto the visitors. So little Johnny just jump, goes and jumps on the uh, motorbike. So Fred goes along with him, having no education, no safety, um, and can get themselves into trouble. And sometimes these things can be addressed by some simple things like having a safe play area on a farm for toddlers and for younger children and simply you know, putting a fence around it or something of that sort. It's amazing how many farms don't have safe play areas, really amazing. I think the other aspect in childhood injury on farms is that uh, children are often um, occupationally involved. Mm. Um, they're, they're part of the, the small industry that is, that is agriculture. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, uh, our family knows uh, quite a number of families that are working on the farm and all of them will tell you about the injuries they've had falling off a tractor or falling off a horse or getting struck by something. And uh, they're working. They're part of, the, uh, they're part of the, the... How much of that is a badge of honour rather than recognising it's a failure in the system? <laughs> I, I, don't think that, uh, I don't think that people do it as a bad, badge of honour. They do it because of the necessity of having children work on a farm. Mm, I, I think there's also, as a parent that raised children on a farm, there is also something uh, pleasant about working with your children mm. and actually teaching them about livestock and animals and mm. how things grow. I do think on reflection though, as a parent who now has grown children, when I look back at some of the tasks that our children did, maybe I actually did think that they were more grown up than they really were. Uh, and uh, I think that's yeah. Uh, yeah. often um, something that um, happens. I, I would like to just go back to David's statistics. I think it's important that they're male statistics, aren't yes. they, I think, in 2002, and, and that perhaps um, recognising that farm women aren't often included in the yes. statistics Very is important. So. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, and, and you know, um, we don't really know, I think, what's happening in hobby farms. Yeah. We don't know what's happening. We, when... actually, we actually have a comment uh, from, uh, from Wagga. Uh, welcome to the program. Good evening. Uh, my name is Patrick Ball. I'm in the School of Pharmacy at Charles State University. Um, so I'm just getting a back up here and I'm not, I don't control the sound in this room to do anything about it. Is it coming through okay to you? Yeah, if you just turn down the volume on your set there, uh, that's why you're getting the feedback and uh, that would be, that will work for, well for you. Nice to hear myself back. Yeah. <laughs> the problem is that the, the set doesn't actually have an obvious volume control. Okay, that's fine. We, I think it's a bit better now. So go on, Patrick. Okay, basically my, my query was around the role of alcohol consumption in all these um, health issues we're talking about. Uh, in particular, I've just been involved in a project with the Linden community, Monash University, Sydney University, where we've actually looked at some of the levels of alcohol consumption uh, in farming and fishery workers, suggesting that there is um, quite a lot of alcohol use and some of it at quite high levels, particularly at the sort of levels where people are not going to sleep it off. Uh, they, you know, alcohol has saturable metabolism and uh, people are still likely to be impaired the following morning. What does the panel feel about the role of alcohol in some of the statistics we've been discussing? Susan? Uh, thanks, Norman. Certainly, Patrick, um, with our work with farming uh, men and women, we've found uh, a higher level of sh short-term high-risk alcohol consumption. And uh, I think some of the challenges for small communities and sporting clubs is very much that uh, the communities often revolve around the consumption of alcohol but uh, it's much higher when it's uh, age standardised than in metropolitan populations for short-term mm. high-risk drinking. Jody, I think some of that short-term also pushes out to quite long-term. <laughs> um, you, you see them and they'll start by saying, yeah, it's just one or two to relax after, after, after work, but it does go on. And especially when then you start getting financial pressures. Um, so they can start the next day quite impaired. Yeah, definitely. And if you've got to drive, 
you mm. might be driving under the influence. Do we have statistics on this? No, I think we, we have statistics, as Patrick have said, from small studies where um, you know, numbers of people of 60, 70, 80, 100 have been questioned. I think we need broader data <coughs> that look, looks at populations. Sounds like Patrick's got some of that. Uh, data coming through, Scott. Well, I think AIHW do indicate mm. that um, that rural people, and I would draw the attention uh, to the difference between rural and agricultural mm. um, communities, and, and that. Uh, uh, but from the so rural, you could have a large regional tone, which yes, only on the periphery has an. So we need to be very careful in using rural data to project mm. upon farming communities and agricultural communities, but but. Uh, the, the data that I've read indicates that, that there's more problematic drinking amongst rural communities than necessarily higher levels of drinking. And I think, Patrick, you need to be looking at... So it's at a bit analogous to Aboriginal communities where not necessarily everybody drinks, but those who do drink, drink to excess. Well, and drink in, in circumstances when um, it has health impacts. And so drinking and driving, drinking and operating machinery, uh, is is more problematic than drinking and not operating so machinery. So my, qu my question then is... Um, and it's linked back to the sustainable farm families, is should there, I mean, people are very, clinicians are very busy, whether you're a nurse, an allied health professional, or a GP in the country, but if the, if the problems are not coming to you, is there a role for somehow getting out to the families? with the prof clinical professionals? Okay, so I, I think when we're doing a farm families program, so we've, our data on alcohol is on two and a half thousand farm men and women, so it is purely a... Uh, I'm talking about more than alcohol here. Okay, so... I'm talking about general health issues. Okay. Is there an outreach role well, here? Uh, most agricultural fairs these days would have a pit stop or some sort of event where there would be a screening opportunity Jim Carners, all, all sorts of country events at which farmers are represented. And there would be a range of activities from taking bloods to um, measuring wastes to uh, doing a K6 to see how, or K10 to see people's levels of psychological distress. And what often happens is that a combination of the um, health service, the GPs, the um, flying doctors perhaps, um, the Aboriginal Medical Service will get together and do that screening. So that, that's a kind of outreach. I mean, Scott, how do you organise your practice to cope with the fact that, or, or do you at all, to cope with the fact that they don't necessarily come to you, the problems are brewing out there and... Look, it's, it's very difficult. I think uh, you've, got to, you've got to make yourself available, uh, but the service demands uh, are such that it's very hard to actually get out. Uh, I office. think that yeah. you've got to be available when uh, they want to come in. I think you've got to use a lot of opportunistic uh, consultation. So uh, farmers, are, in my experience, have a lot of signalling behaviour, so they'll come in for something that they consider to be acceptable to go and s speak to the doc about. Their ticket of entry. That's right, and so then you've got to be looking beyond that and you've got to take that opportunity to do the skin check, to check their blood pressure, to talk about um, uh, their exposure to grains and see if they're getting other issues. And uh, if you don't do that, then you're really going to miss a, a golden opportunity. And the reality is that, mm. that uh, GPs in, in agricultural communities see a large proportion of the community every year, and if they don't see the actual farmer, they'll see somebody else from the household. Uh, and so there are a lot so, of health promotion opportunities. So opportunism is the name yeah, of the group. Absolutely. And you use your registrars and medical students with a, as a bit of outreach, don't you? Well, certainly our medical students get heavily involved in, uh, and, and these are the, um, the, the long look students uh, from Griffith and UQ, and they get involved in, in uh, medical support to rodeos and other, other um, mm. events. Uh, they love the polo. And it's great for them because they love to get some experience, but it's very good to raise the profile of the medical profession, not just to the farmers, but also to their children to consider health professions as a, as a, a valid career path. Uh, so I think there's... I, we also talk to our registrars about how in a small community they are a leader from the point of view of being a role model for alcohol, for smoking, for you know health in general. and they need to assume that role and that role is not really existing in metropolitan circumstances where the anonymity allows you to wander around and not uh, take that, that position of leadership in the community. Go clubbing with impunity. Jordi? Yeah, I think it's a matter of learning what your community is actually wanting from you as well. Um, I know Silver Chain uh, developed or conducted very thorough um, health needs survey um, just recently in Enyaba but it's also done it at some other local sites. But the way that they actually work their health needs survey is to start with a basis questionnaire. They actually hold a community meeting where the public come in and look at the questionnaire that we've got 
and we say to the community, are the right questions on there? Are we asking the right information? And I know we had a very good response at ENIABA where they significantly changed the health needs survey that was being put out so that we were able to get the answers that they wanted us to get to. So now that that's just been collated, we would now take that back to the community to say, okay, this is what the results were. Um, where do we go from now? Where, where do you guys want us to head? Um, what services, you know, whether it's working out agreements with Medicare Local or introducing other services into the town. Um, but the, the community drives it. And from other experience at other silver chain sites, when the community's driving it, you have more success, they, they actually come and participate more. And I think it's interesting you mentioned the Medicare Locals because my understanding of their task is to identify who falls through the gaps yeah. in health services and to actually find ways of filling those gaps yeah. and by encouraging people to work together. Mm. Thank you very much, Patrick, for that call from Wagga. Remember, the number to call in on is 1-800-817-268. We're delighted to put you on air if you phone in. Um, and if you want a degree of greater anonymity, the fax number is 1-800-633-410. Please send in your questions or comments. Our next case study is Judith, who's 60. She lives and works on a farm about 50k from town. She came in to see the locum a little while ago, complaining of a cough and occasional breathlessness. She was diagnosed with a possible ERTI. She's now back at her husband's urging to see the doctor. And Scott, when you look at her, she, you also see a suspicious looking spot on the crease of her nose which needs investigation. What are you going to do about Judith? Well, I think uh, coming in with this history, uh, you still need to consider that, that um, people in agricultural communities get common conditions and have common risk factors. So I'd be asking about smoking. I'd be considering whether or not she has uh, asthma. It's very important to look at her full history, although the, uh, it's likely that we have a medical history for this woman over a number of years, uh, and that's a great advantage. Um, if I am working up in the direction of asthma, I'd be looking at doing some spirometry, at the very least a baseline. But given that she's from a farm, I think coming to see a, uh, uh, an agricultural uh, practitioner, you, uh, health practitioner, you really need to be considering the possibility of farmer's lung in this case or, or even a chemical exposure that's occurring on a recurrent basis and, and uh, investigating that. With respect to the, the spot on her nose, um, I would identify it and then given the complexity of where we're going with the respiratory symptoms, I'd be asking her to come back and putting a reminder in as well to make sure she does come back and uh, taking that as, a, uh, as a, another condition that I'm dealing Will with Will she later come on. back? Well, look, I, I find that um, if you put the right weight on it and indicate that it is manageable, um, then a lot of farmers uh, and, and, and people from agricultural communities, if you put it in the right context, and the, and the right context in my experience is uh, to, to analogise it to looking after the machinery on the property, which they're very, very clear about understanding maintenance schedules and uh, to, to maintain um, the life of the equipment, then they do come back. And I, but then it doesn't also hurt to um, have the receptionist call up and say, you've got an appointment at this time, I'll see you then. So give us a 30-second tutorial on farmer's lung. Well, look, it's a, uh, it's a uh, hypersensitivity pneumonitis, which is a, a type 3 allergic reaction. And in English, uh, essentially, there's an immune response to... So this is uh, grains the, and dust. Uh, some of the antigens in, uh, in particularly hay and, uh, and other... And you can get a fixed abnormality here. Fixed and, typically it, and typically it doesn't fit the asthma. Uh, the, what, the farmer's lungs that I see, um, they've had uh, asthma diagnosed and it doesn't seem to respond. You take a history of compliance, they're compliant. Uh, you listen to their chest, you get the med student to listen to their chest and they're not wheezy, even though they're short of breath. They have um, scattered crackling and suggesting that, that it's, it's actually a distal condition and, and so I find that if you um, modify their treatment, particularly away from the bitter agonists, then um, you get a much better response. Now a question has come in for you Susan and it's from Linda, a nurse, a nurse in Queensland. Can anyone train in the Farm Families program? Uh, we actually have a postgraduate subject in agricultural health and medicine, uh, which is actually what Jody and mm -hmm. Scott have both done. Uh, so, Jody, you're a walking, living example of this. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> yep. So, give us the sales pitch. Is it worth Linda taking, doing the program? Definitely. I travelled across from WA to do the intensive week um, in Hamilton. It was fantastic. I learnt things even though I've grown up on a farm. I've done That's where you learned about farmer's lung, for yep. example. Well, it is because I, yeah, like I said, I grew up on a farm. 
I went to university to become a registered nurse. I've had 20 years remote experience and I actually hadn't heard of the term farmer's lung until I went and actually did this course. Um, yeah, there was lots in zoonoses and all sorts of different Definitely very well worth going. I'm really pleased. And a great lecture in zoonoses. Oh, sensational lecture in, in zoonoses. <laughs> and just a comment, uh, a general practitioner in southern New South Wales comments, I'd be lucky to see most males in farming families once a year and usually in an emergency. Not much chance for opportunistic screening. Well, that's better than none. And the reality is that under those circumstances, there is an opportunity to talk to them about other matters. And... Uh, uh, the statistics clearly show that we do see these people and, and very often it is associated with trauma, uh, but that's an opportunity and it can't be missed. And Susan, do we know whether or not there are particular hazards or things that happen to people with particular tasks on the farm? So or whether you're, you're a cropping, we do mostly cropping or whether or not you're most, you, you've got, you're, you're, you're in livestock, for example. Certainly. We, we certainly know that if you've got livestock, uh, you're most likely to be injured by livestock. They're the things that cause the most amount of injuries. The things that cause the uh, most amount of death is obviously uh, the four-wheelers and um, tractors. But certainly um, sheep in particular are pretty nasty and so are cattle. Uh, in fact, dairy tend to just get bruises uh, rather than serious kind of knees and those kind of things. So we, we do know that. We also know that from our respiratory studies that um, sheep and cropping people were the most likely to have uh, respiratory issues. Let's go to our next case study, who's Tommy, 13 years old, fell off his quad bike and has a head injury. His father's brought him into Jody, the remote area <coughs> nursing in the Yaba. He's bleeding. His father's anxious for you to expedite his son's treatment. Jody. Okay. Well, I guess, yeah, start off by doing a, a uh, initial assessment, airway, breathing, circulation, doing a secretary assessment. Also, while doing that, um, finding out exactly what did happen so you can look at, investigate what sort of injuries you would be looking at. And then, then depending on the results of that, whether if it was a simple suturing, I could do that. Well, I think we can show you what happened here. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So this was actually a boy that came into Pittsworth uh, a couple of weeks ago that I got a photograph of, and he'd in fact come off his odd bike. He knocked himself out? He wasn't knocked out, fortunately, um, and uh, he also wasn't driving, uh, so it's not just the, uh, the person in charge of the vehicle that's at risk, uh, but, uh, and he wasn't wearing a helmet. Obviously. <laughs> and the quad bike wasn't designed for two people? Well, they are designed for two people, but not the way he was riding. Okay. <laughs> Enough said. <laughs> but it was a great opportunity for him to go and get his helmet thereafter, uh, and a good opportunity for a medical student to learn how to use the glue. Uh, when, I, when I hear that someone's going out mustering can't possibly wear a helmet because they're going to be out in 40 degree temperatures for 12 hours a day, I mean, how, how do you respond to that? Uh, uh, well, I mean, you probably see more 40 degree temperatures than I do. <laughs> I see lots of that. There's actually new helmets that have been designed now. They're a lot lighter weight. They actually come up higher above the ear so another argument that farmers used to throw up was that they couldn't hear if they were mustering as a group they couldn't hear either each other speak and they couldn't um, if the sheep were beginning to pant or things like that they couldn't hear that mm. whereas the, the new style helmets they're a lot lighter and they are able to hear each other so that's no longer I think the other aspect is the uh, is the sun protection mm. and uh, my younger son William wears a, uh, a hat with a with um, coverage under his bicycle helmet and I you know there's no reason why he can't do that it doesn't look spectacular but it's certainly protective mm. <laughs> particularly if you've got melanoma in the family it's the sort of thing that farmers need to be uh, instilling yeah. in their children at the start. We certainly take the the shorty helmet that Jody was talking to all our farm families projects and they often haven't ever seen the shorty helmet. Yeah. I guess the other thing that is of concern though if a 40 degree heat is there is some uh, evidence to suggest that you can get uh, cerebral heating uh, and I think that is a real concern in uh, how much populations. Do, how much do the manufacturers take responsibility for some information? I mean, the, the manufacturers of tractors have taken increasing responsibility for safety on the tractors, perhaps because they've been forced to, but to the extent to which there are partnerships available for, with industry for safety, because it's not in the manufacturer's interest to get a bad name for quad bikes, sure. for example. Do we know? One of the difficulties is, of course, if, if quad bikes are thought of as dangerous, that goes against the manufacturer's interests in terms of selling Which indeed they are. Well. 
I think you'll find the guidelines by the manufacturers is very clear that you are expected to wear a helmet mm. and that you're certainly not to put two people on it and you are not to add extra bits and pieces to the um, the quad bike because yeah, once you do that you alter the center of gravity mm. so it, it is um, you know, there, I guess there's both sides. Which is Scott's to this. point that you might not necessarily be making it safer with some of the kit that you're going to put on it. Mm. Mm. Absolutely, but you also shouldn't have two people on it. Mm. They're not. Let's go to Alan now. Alan's 20 years old, banana picker from North Queensland who prevents with flu like symptoms. He's only here because his wife made him come. He doesn't think he's particularly unwell and he likes to look after himself and he thinks he's just wasting the doctor's time. Um, he says he also has chills, he doesn't look that well, he's got headaches, a bit of tummy pain. When you look at him, Scott, he looks a bit jaundiced. So uh, it's good that his name's Alan because I, I suspect that he, it may also be um, Friedrich. Um, there's a lot of transient workers uh, do fruit picking uh, during the season and they're incredibly valued parts of the, of the industry and necessary for the industry. Uh, the likelihood, the possibility is that this, this fellow may actually have uh, actually gone through Southeast Asia and this was his next stop and this may in fact be hepatitis A. Uh, but I think given the exposure so that he's so had... So it's nothing to do with the farming at all? Incidental. And I, you always need to take a, uh, a full occupational history which includes travel. Uh, but in this case I think we really need to be thinking about uh, leptospirosis uh, as a possibility because of the exposure um, to... Uh, to picking uh, and, and his probable lack of adequate briefing um, on, on protecting himself uh, in the occupational circumstance. So for people like me who haven't dealt with leptospirosis since we got a multi-choice questionnaire in our membership exam, um, just give us the lowdown on lepto. Well, leptospirosis is a spirochete that uh, exists in um, a number of domesticated mammals. Uh, it's transmitted in a, in a number of ways. Um, and gets into uh, humans uh, can be potentially by inhalation, uh, but not uncommonly by damage to skin. Uh, and if and if there's uh, contaminated urine on a um, on a banana tree stem, for instance, uh, and and this fellow has been grabbing it and, and probably damaging his hands, uh, then you certainly can contract it that way. But um, uh, there has been a number of outbreaks recently. Um, Bruce Chater and Katie Goot in Theodore uh, identified four cases during the floods. Uh, uh, just last, after the floods, yeah. Just after the floods. And, and that was essentially in people that were um, cleaning up. They were, they were in water, standing in water, uh, and, and probably had damaged hands or damaged skin on their legs uh, and uh, contracted, probably contracted the illness in that way. And were diagnosed and, and treated. And the fancy ID physicians in the city didn't believe them. Well, yeah, I, look, I think it's to, it's to Bruce and Katie's credit that that they stuck to their guns and identified it, confirmed it, treated it and, and, uh, and managed these cases. And I must say since, um, since those cases and since the, the Queensland floods of 2010, 2011, uh, there's been a significant increase in leptospirosis uh, in Queensland. And it's prevented how? Protective clothing? Uh, it's, pre it's prevented uh, by not getting in contact with the spirochete. Uh, you could argue <laughs> well, that you well, could use... So, so as a transient worker, you need a microscope. <laughs> Take a slide before you walk on and the field. postgraduate education. Well, yeah, I, I mean, it's potentially you could use um, some prophylaxis, chemoprophylaxis, but I think ideally uh, the best way to prevent it is, is the way the cane workers have prevented it. And you rarely see leptospirosis in cane workers now because they harvest the cane in, in a tractor. Uh, and they're away from the at-risk exposure. So engineering... So no exercise, they get fatter and they get well, heart disease, but they don't get But they get don't lepto. get their leptospirosis. <laughs> and, and penicillin is the treatment? Well, I would normally use doxycycline, but... Doxycycline, uh, I love right. doxycycline. <laughs> <laughs> Which I think is what you, Bruce used in Theodore. <laughs> yes. I think uh, the other one is in dairy farms, and of course often you can uh, inoculate cows now for leptospirosis, but obviously urine splash is very common for dairy farmers. Mm -hmm. So we see it a lot in our farm families. And that's a great example of engineering out risks as well in that if you have a, a urine deflector yeah. uh, in a dairy battery then uh, you significantly reduce the risk of leptospirosis. But not only dairy as well, I've seen cases of it from beef cattle. Mm. Let's move on to Elsa who's recently been referred from uh, the Sustainable Farm Families program where she had screened for diabetes and she came up with an OSD risk score of 15 fasting blood sugar of 5.9. She's only been to see you intermittently over the last 20 years because she lives out of town, three hours out of town. And since she last saw her, she's put on quite a lot of weight, BMI 35, and uh, she's got a 14-year-old daughter with her who's also overweight. 
and um, she's come to see you following the diabetes screening, Scott. Well, this certainly is a, uh, a concerning uh, levels and uh, can I say that it, it reflects the diversity of practice in, in rural medicine that you get to see a number of these different cases and um, a, a metabolic condition like this is, uh, is very common. Uh, it's, it would also be commonly identified in, uh, in routine health checks. Uh, this woman clearly needs to be further investigated uh, and the possibility is that she, or the probability is that she is at a much higher risk of uh, developing diabetes and potentially cardiovascular disease risk. So her waist circumference is 100, her blood pressure is 160 on 95. So she's heading towards the unholy um, four. Uh, I'd be interested in knowing what her uh, lipid profile is. High triglycerides, high LDL. And low HDLs, no doubt. Mm. Uh, so she's, she's at very high risk uh, of, of going on to develop diabetes and uh, that's going to significantly reduce her life and the quality of her life at the end of it. Now the NHMRC guidelines would say lifestyle change and I would be the first to identify that and, and talk to her about that. The, given her relative isolation, the, the chances her, of her accessing uh, structured, um, ready-made uh, lifestyle modification programs is, is limited. Uh, we're fortunate that a number of the general practice divisions that I'm associated with uh, in southern Queensland are very good at providing these uh, and projecting them out into rural areas. But nevertheless, it's very difficult working on a farm to, uh, to access an exercise physiologist and a dietitian um, and, and get these sorts of services to actually make uh, changes to her life. And so I would tend to have a, um, I, I would certainly be looking to see her again in the very near future to see how she's progressing, provide as much counselling as I have, as I can. Um, very often I find that practice nurses in rural practices are multi-skilled and probably could provide some of this advice. So Jodie, what do you do about some of this? Because it is hard to get lifestyle change. She's probably working on the farm, the farm's not doing well, and there's all sorts of other things going on in her life which are more important than her health. Yeah, I, I would actually sit with her one-on-one, -on -one, find probably investigate what she thought her, her biggest issue was, seeing how we could work together, whether it's um, getting telehealth services in, um, whether it be dietitian, physio or anything like that, or actually me working one on one with her um, to try and change her thought, thought process and show her that there is actually so ways to So this would be like change. Skyping from home? Yeah. With the yep. dietitian? Yes. Yep. Do you think she might be depressed? There's certainly the possibility. Well, we would have done a screening at Sustainable Farm Family, yeah. so we'd have that data. Yeah. Well, she wasn't depressed before you did her oyster <laughs> use, or she's going to be depressed afterwards. If I was doing a full assessment, I'd be doing an assessment. Um, yeah, we so use the DAS score. Certainly depression is associated with weight gain. Mm. Because we have, we have a better spread of allied health workers across rural Australia than we do GPs, for instance. And you know, a, a number of them are trained in behaviour change of one sort or another. Mm. And this, this notion of lifestyle change, do you have any success to, to claim for SFF? Uh, certainly if, if they have three or more risk factors, which clearly uh, ELSA does. But it looked like it was all men that you were dealing with, not women. Uh, I don't know. We have 54% men, 46% women. So right. we are very much about farming men and women, farming families. So uh, certainly we'd be expecting Elsa to uh, come back obviously the following year. She'd be developing an action plan. Um, and we have also done some work with um, a DVD called Farming Fit, which shows farmers how to exercise on farm, which so may sound a tips. bit funny. Well, actually being able to use doorways, workshop benches, uh, steps on the front veranda. One of our studies found that in fact, they didn't know while they couldn't access a gym, they were interested in learning how to do it on farm. Tell us about your toolkit, David. Well, the Australian College of Ag Agricultural Health and Safety at Moree have put all this stuff together. They've looked at the risks. They've looked at the actions that can be taken to address the risks. And they've put it together in a toolkit which has checklists, which has DVD, and which has um, posters which you can put up in a practice. And our initial thought was that this might be of use for people um, who are practitioners, you know, GPs in general practices. Where it seems to have a considerable effect is for people in training, trying to get a culture um, amongst rural health mm. practitioners and an understanding of what it is their clients and their patients need, what they experience, and how they can address some of those issues so that they are competent and capable of addressing the needs of 
rural residents and farmers in particular. But Scott, just to round off on ELSA, your trigger presumably for pharmacological interventions would be low. Oh, I tend to have a low threshold and, and getting her back and reviewing how she's going, I'd be looking to see whether she's actually going at all. Um, and moving on to um, pharmacological interventions, um, because you're more likely, uh, they're more likely to, to need to progress to that. They're, they're not going to have access to the sort of services and therefore you need to do what you can to um, head off Reduce diabetes. The risk. Yeah. Jim's a sheep farmer, age 57, referred to Scott from a rural financial counsellor. And over the last four months, he's lost weight, he's not sleeping, he's got aches and pains, listless, and he's finding all this is becoming quite debilitating. He lost a lot of stock in the bushfires and floods, and he's drinking a bit more since his wife has been away being treated for breast cancer. Scott, you have a busy day, not straightforward cases. Yeah, it's always busy in rural practice, but it's, it's a great diversity of, of practice. And in, in this case, uh, weight loss, sleep disturbance, somatic symptoms, listlessness and fatigue, potentially substance abuse. This fellow is starting to meet the requirements for the diagnosis of depression. And so I guess one of the first questions I'd be asking uh, after actually attempting to create some report, I find the best way to create report with these people is to actually understand the circumstances they're coming from and to be able to speak sensibly about the agricultural community and, and his industry. But you've really got to get to the question of suicide. Which is an important issue, particularly oh, for a, a new practitioner in the area. Yeah, you've yeah. got to know the lingo. Well, we, we take our registrars and our students to farms. Uh, we get them to meet farmers, to walk around with farmers, to, to start to speak the lingo. And uh, it's a great way to create rapport if you can understand the crop, that, if you can even mention the crop that they're, um, they're growing and, and ask them how they're going, what, how much land have they got under sorghum and that sort of... Uh, it, it indicates that you have an empathy for what they're, what they're doing. And particularly if you're going to ask somebody... And don't ask them where the best coffee is locally. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Look, but, but particularly if you're going to move on to the question of suicidal ideation, which you absolutely have to in this case, you need to have created some rapport. And it can't be something that takes multiple consultations to develop. Um, you need to determine if this fellow is at risk uh, but there are possi other possibilities for this and, and obviously we need to investigate for, um, for other organic causes for this condition. Uh, but in my experience, uh, this fellow's got a, a, a reasonable reason to be um, depressed. Uh, and probably the most practical thing we can do is to find a way that he can get to see his wife. I had a great case um, about two weeks ago in Clifton where we had a... Um, a gentleman whose uh, wife was uh, dying in a palliative care unit um, and he didn't have a, a license and we were able to get his license back, get him in his car and there was no need to treat him with um, antidepressants. It, all it needed was to give a, a practical means for him to mm -hmm. spend the last couple of weeks with his wife and uh, mm -hmm. I think those are the sort of uh, solutions that I'd be looking for in this case. Jordy? And I'd also be looking um, at the option of a financial counsellor, whether some good as well, he, I know he realised he has an issues with his wife, but if he's, if he's lost stock, if he's um, having a, a, a bad season, financial pressure may be on. So by getting that financial advice... So practical problem solving yeah, is really definitely. what you're talking about. Yeah, definitely. Which is like, uh, you know, the story that you get with floods and, um, and fire is that people don't need the grief counselling, they, they need a carpenter and a plumber and an electrician. Yeah. Mm. And they, they need it now. I mean, some, some of the research has shown that the role of the financial counsellor and the networks that provide health care are critical and that rural practitioners need to have much broader than medical networks. They need to have social networks. They need to be aware of these things and they need to be able to refer people to non-medical sources if that's, that's right. where their help yeah. is going to come. Let's look at some useful websites, David. Yeah. Um, well, we've got... Um, Three useful websites here. One is Farm Safe Australia. Um, the second, which I, which I know better, is the Australian Centre for Agricultural Health and Safety, which is um, the producer of the toolkit and which has um, put together a lot of the information that people need if they're to understand the risks and the responses that make sense in rural farm health. And the third one is the National Centre for Farmer Health, which is Susan's centre, which is we've been talking about this evening and is running programs so that farmers can address the risk factors and the lifestyle factors that will give them better health. Just before we close, Scott, just come back to something we said before we came on air about 
assessment tools and how you modify them for yeah. the, the, the practical aspects of rural living. Look, I, I think the Beyond Blue website's another one that I would yep. commonly recommend yes. for patients and uh, on that you can get the K10. Um, but I find that if you, if you just use the K10 as written, it comes over clunky and, and with cultural insensitivity. You really need to be modifying it, not, notwithstanding that you're potentially modifying its validity, but you've got to put it into words that sound natural from you, uh, that fit with the circumstance that the individual's in, in an agricultural community, and K10 wasn't written for that. Uh, look, I'd also mention in this case the situation of uh, the perception of that, that, that uh, agricultural communities have greater resilience collectively, and I think in this case uh, it's, a, it's a relevant feature, uh, and you need to be able to mobilise that resilience uh, in, in the community to support this family. Uh, and you see that... So uh, even though they might be physically isolated, they're not necessarily socially isolated? Rarely are they socially isolated, I find, in rural communities, and that's one of the great strengths of, of, uh, of these communities. Uh, and you need to tap into that. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's something that's not readily identifiable, but uh, if you can find a way to assist them from the community, then it's, it's better than most SSRIs. Mm. What are your take-home messages, David? Well, my take-home message is that we've got to invest in the mainstream services, because it's those services that are available day by day. It's the services that Scott's part of, that Jody's part of, and that farmers need to be able to, and their families need to be able to access services that are aware of their needs, that are responsive, and that are high quality. So invest in the mainstream day-to-day -day services because they're there. Jody? Okay. I think probably having a multidisciplinary approach, but also having the community involved in that, having the community fully aware of the services that are available, and working together to make sure that the right services are actually in that community so that you can do the best, have the best outcomes. Of health outcomes. Scott? There needs to be an awareness um, instilled in training of the circumstances that people are in and I'm, particularly I think it's important to develop applied knowledge in agricultural health and medicine um, in the discipline of rural health. That needs to be in the training uh, from early on and uh, to identify that this is a, a distinct discipline within rural health. Susan? Uh, Norman, I think that uh, farm men and women uh, and agricultural workers are a specific target group and need to be treated as such and health professionals need to be culturally competent when working with those people. And remember, women work on the farm too. Absolutely, Absolutely. don't forget that. So I hope you've enjoyed the program as much as I have. Fascinating, I've learned a lot. If you're interested in obtaining more information about the issues raised, there are a number of resources available on the Rural Health Education Foundation's website rhef.com.au. Now, don't forget to complete and send in your evaluation forms and register for CPD points by completing the attendance sheet. Our thanks to the Department of Health and Ageing for making the program possible, but our thanks also to you for taking the time to attend and contribute. I'm Norman Swan. I'll see you next time.